We're going to be talking about medical practice valuation and exit execution. A formula approach or rule of thumb makes your practice valuation average. But who really wants to settle for average? As you may be leaving significant dollars at the closing table. Learn which simple levers you can pull at least two years prior to a planned exit in order to maximize your practice's value. There are many reasons you need to understand the value of your medical practice, but most practitioners do not start thinking about it until presented with an opportunity to sell or a catastrophe happens. Evaluation of any business is a complex process, but luckily Morif has three very experienced guides, um, which are all members of Morif. Um, and they are going to be here to navigate you through the process. First, we have Tim Caldwell of Pension Investors Corporation of Orlando. We have Janelle Padula. Is that okay? I can't believe I didn't know how to pronounce your last name. Um, of Longwood CBA and George Rosen of Contango Investments and Florida Business Evalu Evaluations. And they will um, I'll give you more of their bio along the way. So take it away, guys. Thank you so much for coming this morning, and I wanted to touch on something you said. Making a practice more transparent from the outside buyer's perspective reduces that perceived level of risk, and that directly impacts and increases the value. So that, that's very well taken, that point. Um, we wanted to address with Tim some of the strategies in making your work-life balance. Yeah, many times, um I probably give you a little bit of a background in in who we are as a as a third party consultant uh, administrator for pension investors. We deal with a lot of small businesses, small uh, medical practices, and in going through the process of of evaluating and determining what the the practice is worth is not just a financial transaction that they might go through with their CPA. It's part of it. And as Dorothy was, was um, introducing us, you know, the, the number two years came up. Actually, an ideal number of years is probably seven in order to really accomplish and, and to have some changes. Because a practice is, is generally the primary source of, of income for, for the physician. Or, and it could be multiple physicians. And, and then they have different ages. And so, you know, that is going to be, at the end game, their primary source of wealth that they think, okay, this is, this is going to determine how I'm going to be able to live the rest of my life, which is true for everyone, in, in a sense, if you think about your own businesses. You, you, try, to, you try to start at a certain time and, and, and increase your equity or your wealth, and you can do that in many different ways. But many times the, the, the uh, practices are doing that in a, in, a, in a more reactionary method, and they're not very proactive. And so what we believe and how we've come together uh, as, as individual practitioners and, and created this, this collaborative effort, uh, not only f for all the other resources in, in uh, Moroff, but we've, we've taken it so that we can be proactive from the perspective of financial and, and um, uh, also personal and, and emotional. And so when you can do that, you'll see there's a, there's a note in there that talks about work life and balance. And one of the reasons why I, I chose to, to work with Janelle's firm and, uh, and Tom Abersart personally was because of some of their, their goals in work life and balance. And I think that's probably one of the biggest um, missing components because we're so darn busy working in our businesses, in, in our practices, and in, in, in accomplishing uh, inefficiencies are, are rampant. So, so one of the reasons why I like what their, their philosophy was is that it, you want to manage your practice so that it accomplishes your personal goals and not, not forget about those, because we do. If we look at how we go through life in these different seasons and these different phases, we tend to to sometimes have to change in midstream and adjust because of either legislation or, or changes in, in the community environment, whatever. Some things we can't even control. So to be proactive and to go after it and have a, and have a, a plan instead of trying to just react to something. Uh, for instance, uh, there's so many times, and I think Janelle has an example of, 
of this later, that I'll get a, a question that says, how do I, how do I fix my tax problem? Well, it's already seven or eight months after the tax year problem. So um, you can't do that retroactively. So I'm only in the next year, and I'm trying to fix things, and I'm trying to plan with, with the, uh, the owner or the, the practitioner. So proactively managing it not only will increase the value as it goes, but it will, it will proportionally allow the, the practice owners to take some of those, those dollars, that, those equity dollars, each and every year. I mean, isn't it a lot easier to save monies on a, in smaller chunks than they have to come and just say, oh, I'm just going to go pull out a big chunk of money at one point in time. It's harder to do that. It's, it's easier to budget. It, it's no different when you're going through this process um, of, of, of um, creating equity in a company. The, the next topic that was, that's going to come up here is, is to begin with the end in mind. And what I think is important about this, all those, those questions are, are really good, is, is each person's idea of what retirement looks like and when that's going to happen is different. And if you can't get past, if you can't understand what that goal is first, nothing else will happen. Nothing. It will, I've gone through 30 years of this and, and that is the biggest stumbling block because a lot of times that is a practitioner's life, their business. That's all they do. They don't have anything else. There's no hobby sometimes. And if there is, it's, it's limited. And they've built this from, from birth. They birthed it and it's just, that's their baby. So it's hard to get through that process. And, and the, the timing of when, that's, when, that's, when that happens is, is critical, especially today, because just like technology and, and you know, everyone's, everyone sees how fast that's changing, that's happening in the business as well. Things are happening behind the scenes that they're having to adapt to, and um, it's hard to do that while you're still seeing a ton of people, and while you're still dealing with insurance carriers, and while you're still dealing with all the issues that a medical practice deals with. And it's the same with other business owners as well. Tim, so, can I jump in? Yes, please. In one particular instance, Tim introduced me to a, cu a couple business owners who had had their business for over 30 years. They'd grown it to a $12 million operation, and part of their exit plan was to put in professional management and be able to step away. And it was a fantastic plan. Unfortunately, the economy didn't cooperate, and they pretty much lost everything. The management team they put in place grew it to about $18 million, and it collapsed the following year with a lot of pushbacks from their suppliers and customers. And their financial picture changed radically. Fortunately for them, they had enough of their nest egg outside of the business. They'd been planning for this retirement all along the way, and having that business is just one component in their retirement plan, which was a big part of it. It was a big piece. Fortunately, they didn't lose their house. They still have most of their outside assets intact, but it could have gone dramatically the other way yeah so, and, and that actually ended well for that for that particular client it didn't it didn't end up in the 10 min, 10 to 12 million dollar range but they had we had set up a plan and, and worked with them for 20 years and they had uh, multiple millions of dollars in a qualified retirement plan and and then they sold their business for a little over three and a half um, so it still it still turned out good but it did and it and it changes those those situations they thought you know a lot of times, do I, how do I sell my business? Do I sell it to someone inside? Well, a lot of times those people don't have any money. They were working hard and they don't have a big nest egg yet. And they brought in some people that said they wanted to, they wanted to buy the business from them and it turned out that, that they had a whole different uh, goal in mind and they wanted to dismantle the entire business and that's why uh, it, it just imploded. So. Everything, everyone, everyone's situation is different how they can do it. And there's no wrong way to do it. It just takes time. It, you just can't change things overnight and, and try to make it work. Transparency in the practice. If you have processes in place and repeatable processes to where it's not an individual has to stop and figure out what to do in this instance, and you put different methods of tracking what direction those processes are 
going? Are they getting more efficient or less efficient? And how do you react to the changes in the marketplace and your patient mix? Uh, value stream mapping is one of the keywords there. But really, if an outsider can gain transparency into the practice, and this is universal, a business, a practice, anything, that's how they lower their perceived level of risk. And it's that informed judgment is superior to the uninformed emotion. When we get over to the KPIs, key performance indicators, some of those are going to be financial. Some of those are going to be operational. And financial KPIs are there to tell us what's happened historically. Tracking those should give us some insight into what's going to happen in the future. But the processes that we're going to put metrics to, these are uh, active medical records per physician. If we see this increasing, we can see two things happening. We could find we're getting burnout, or we could see more efficiency gained. And understanding the causes for what's driving the direction of that metric is what we're talking about in causal analysis. So again, it's transparency. If you have the metrics in place to figure out where you are, where you've been, and project where you're going, that lowers the perceived risk a buyer is going to have. When we talk about practice valuation, there's two moving parts. And I'm going to use specifically the discounted future earnings example. And also, it, it should be the same value arrived at if you're using a discounted future earnings or a capitalization of earnings. And the two moving parts in this are the level of earnings and the amount of risk assumed. When we talk about capitalization, that's a big word for a multiplier. It's a special type of multiplier, but that earnings figure I'll explain on the next slide. The capitalization rate, which is the inverse multiplier, is going to be based upon the valuator's perceived level of risk. Now, each individual buyer is going to have their own unique level of risk that they're coming into this expecting to see related to the future sustainability of the forward-looking cash flows. Can I ask a question? Please. What's the, what is the, um, the normal capitalization number for a, a medical practice? I mean, is there, you have some examples of different types of practices, that, whether they're small, medium, large, two times, four times, when people are looking to? Well, before you start throwing out rules of thumb oh. and averages, yeah. first you have to decide upon what is that earnings figure that we're going to use as the benchmark. So anytime somebody asks for what's the average multiple, you've got to step back and say multiple of what? <laughs> <laughs> if I'm talking about owner benefit, that's a very different number from the EBITDA, or in Florida we pronounce it EBITDA. Up in New York they call it EBITDA. And basically that's just the same thing as the operating income plus the depreciation, amortization, interest, and taxes. Um, but let's talk about the earnings before we address what is a good multiplier. Good thought. When we're using a market approach, that just means we're going to go out to see what historic transactions transacted. And we're going to take certain metrics out of that database, find what the averages are, what the medians are, what the norms are. And then we're going to apply it to an earnings figure or a revenue figure. Revenue is one level of earnings. Gross profits, another one. Operating income, EBIT, EBITDA, after-tax earnings. All these things are just levels of earnings. So before you start applying multiples, make sure we're all in agreement upon multiple of what. So if we're talking about an owner benefit, that is your operating income plus all of the non-cash expenses, which we call depreciation and amortization. And that's because you've already spent the money in a prior year. You just can't deduct it this year. You have to deduct it over time. Interest expense is something that we're automatically going to add back because we want to look at that company relative to its peer group without the debt structure in place so we can normalize everything to compare apples to apples. If I've got a lot of debt, I'm going to have a lot more interest expense than you do. And because of that, it's going to skew the numbers if we don't normalize those earnings. Then we're going to talk about adjusting for the compensation. And with medical practitioners, that salary component and fair market replacement salary is a whole other science of figuring out what is market rate. 
and there's databases and companies that specialize in nothing but how much should I pay that doctor if he's on staff? And that's going to be based upon different methodologies for reimbursement. And what's left over is the investor's return on investment. Whether I'm a medical practitioner working for somebody else, if I'm buying another practice, that salary component, I'm, I've got to take out of that owner benefit to factor the return on investment portion. How much am I paying for the goodwill value over and above the job I'm going to get? There's a lot of additional addbacks, and I'm going to address just a little bit with Janelle here. When we talk about addbacks, we're starting with your historic financial statement, and then we're going to go into the line items. We're not going to get into the expense category in your QuickBooks or in your uh, journals. We want to know, based on a P&L, what line items can we consider a benefit of owning the business? And Janelle, would you please talk about making that sense? Before you do, can I ask another question? Of course. Okay, so the last slide, can you go back one slide, where it says officer's portion of pension, mm -hmm. is, that, is that dealing with the retirement plan? Absolutely. Is that, are you saying that it's bad for them to have a retirement plan? Absolutely not. <laughs> Good. But in the normalization, in the normalization, that is what we term a discretionary expense because the officer and the owners decide on how much we're going to apply to that. What a great response because it is discretionary. And a lot of the times when I get brought in, this becomes the biggest discussion and it ties right into the compensation on, on what they're paying themselves because generally they might want to say, I want to save money and pay myself less in W-2 salary I want to take because many many are S-Corps, and take pass-through so I can save on some of these taxes, which can, can be a, a detriment to actually getting some of those dollars out in the form of a pension plan as owner perks. Because they, the design of the plan can be, if I start early enough, I can pull out 2 to $3 million worth of my, my equity, my, my net worth at the end of the day. And what that does is it doesn't force me to have to create a big number on a valuation to get a big person, another outside person to buy at a big number because what's a big number then generate? Big taxes because I'm going to pay half the money in taxes. So why would I want to n forego and, and play games with compensation and some of these other perks and, and, and miss out on the opportunity to get this equity out? Because if I pull that money out over 10 years and get a couple million bucks and then let it set deferred, and let it grow at a four to six percent number. That's going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of six to eight million versus two. And none of that's getting taxed. That's where the equity comes out, and that's where the planning is so important. And when the valuation gets done, it's a true valuation for what it is. And they don't. And they can. They may be able to sell it to somebody inside or to a team of people. So it's very important. That's that's probably one of the biggest areas that they. Um, that a practitioner just ignores until they get a really good CPA that starts to have a, a, you know, a meaningful discussion with them. Thank you. That was a really good question, George. Thank you. <laughs> Chanel, would you touch on that? So I, I'll say that um, for practitioners and regular business owners alike, um, we've seen some things just on the general ledger or the trial balance, essentially, um, where they'll lump something as simple as payroll altogether. So the owner's payroll is stuck in the staff payroll number. Possibly the payroll taxes are stuck in that number. Um, not really transparent at all. So the worst thing that you can do as any business owner or practice owner is create a puzzle for your dream team. Um, because the whole goal is to surround yourself with the people that can make you successful and help you transition to wherever it is you want to be in your work-life balance situation. Um, before really going into the financial part of it, I think really touching on some of the earlier slides, standardizing process is probably one of the keys that you can do. In a physician's practice, the business is the physician in most cases. So to Tim's point, if you can strip out that equity earlier and not rely on what that practice sale number is, for your retirement number, probably the best financial decision that you're going to make um, by far in your career. Because if you leave, how many of those patients just might follow? I mean, you may have all the processes in place. 
that make it attractive to the next person coming in. The office staff knows their job inside and out. You know, your financials are running themselves. Your billing is automated. Different, you know, things like that. But the, the physician is the business. And if you can somehow find a way to transition around that or bring in a succession buyer where they start to build that patient base themselves, you might have a higher valuation. But to Tim's point, stripping it out earlier because that valuation may not be there in total once you walk out of the business. So again, having clean, transparent financials also helps that valuation number. So if they know exactly what those numbers look like that you did strip out, they can start to make their plan to find out what they may be able to build up and strip out so that they're not stuck kind of holding the bag on a practice that may or may not be worth what it was when that practitioner was in place. On that note also, as an appraiser, I don't want to get into the individual expense categories and go hunting. So if it's not on a single line item, easy for me to recapture and justify based on the description for that expense category, you're not going to get that added back, which $1 not added back can be on a multiple, and if we're talking about excess earnings of four or five times. And as an appraiser, if you don't make it easy for me, it's impacting the value of your business because I'm going to have somebody looking over my shoulder and reviewing appraisals. And if I'm overzealous in trying to hit the target, then I've just violated my credo as an appraiser to be neutral and unbiased. So make it easy. Uh, Janelle, can you talk about the meeting you had yesterday? Yesterday, we, um, myself and Tom, met with uh, a business owners, they own a, a real estate company. And she was working with her current CPA and they're doing things in a rear view method, so to speak. And that's basically where you're not really looking at your numbers all year long. You're looking at them in January when it's too late because December 31st has already passed. And she made the comment to me that, you know, we're gonna put on an additional 80,000 in net income this year between now and the end of the year. So I should probably go out and buy some equipment and buy a car and replace that carpet in the back room. I really don't need to, but I don't want to pay a whole lot in taxes. And m my response was, do you need those things? And she said, well, no, my car's only two years old. That carpet's only two years old, but I don't want to pay a lot in taxes. And again, I think that's where it's our job as support teams to educate on how to make this money tax sheltered. And so I said, well, what if we put in a defined benefit plan for you and you were able to strip out the maximum amount of equity every year and that became tax deferred or in some cases tax free if you're doing a Roth? Well, I never knew about that. And how does that benefit me? Well, it lowers taxable income and also shelters the remainder of it through the owner benefit portion, profit sharing. And then you have a little added bonus for some of your legacy employees, you know, giving them one or two or even three or four percent. If you look at it, you're giving them a very small portion to strip out an enormous portion for yourself. It's just trying to help people to not, why would you buy that if you don't need it? But I can understand they don't want to give it all away to Uncle Sam either. So there are smarter ways. Yeah, you know, the numbers are actually, in, in her example, with the smaller practices, and many of them are, uh, north of 90% goes to the practitioners and about it's less than a 10% cost overall at, for the life of the plan for all of the uh, uh, other employees. So it's pretty, it's pretty, uh, it's a good impact. Let me talk about that multiplier or that capitalization rate. If I tell you 20 goes into 100 five times, that's the same thing as saying that if 20% is the cap rate, and I'm dividing an earnings figure, 100,000 by 0.20, I'm gonna wind up with $500,000 in value. Now, building up to a cap rate is assuming risk-free rates, then looking at the numbers in the stock market for what are average returns, then adding a company-specific or a practice-specific risk factor. And that risk factor is going to directly tie into those KPIs and understanding the processes within that business and knowing what direction we're heading 
based on those KPIs and the trends. And if I've got transparency and I can perceive a lower risk because I understand what's happening in that practice and why it's valued or should be valued at the seller's asking price, a 4% capitalization rate difference, the difference between 22% cap rate and 18% cap rate is not 4% of the business value. Here's an example if I take that same $100,000 earning stream and divide it by 0.18, a lower cap rate gives me a higher value. That's a $555,000 practice value. If that same $100,000 that practice is throwing off in excess earnings, or EBITDA, is on a 22% cap rate, only four percentage points different on the cap rate, it's a $100,000 difference in practice value. So it's so important to make sure that an outsider has transparency and understands what's happening inside that practice. We're going to switch gears and talk about, okay, we've got the buy-sell agreement in place. Now we're negotiating things. There's the practice value. That's the key thing that we as valuators are brought in for. There's other components of that negotiation. There's going to be allocation. And that's something Janelle is very qualified to talk on. So in, as the slide states, in most cases, um, you're not buying the actual entity itself. And there's a lot of reasons why you wouldn't. Mostly a liability issues. If there are any skeletons um, in the closet of that entity and you buy that entity as is with, with its tax ID number and everything in place, any and all claims against that entity can come back to the buyer. So there are rare cases where you would buy an entity the one I can think of off the top of my head is where it has a non-transferable liquor license, for example. Or and, contracts. Yeah, or government contracts or regular contracts that are all non-transferable. Then you would buy the entity and obviously do your due diligence. For the most part, everything is going to be an asset sale. So you've settled on your purchase price and you know, whatever that dollar figure is. And now this is kind of where all your negotiating skills are going to come in because this is going to impact both the buyer and seller, but they have competing interests in this particular case. So the IRS actually demands that you report asset allocation and both the buyer and seller have to report these respectively. Same piece of paper, same form, has to be in each return. And so a buyer wants to sell more, I'm sorry, wants to buy more fixed asset type items. They want to buy the desk, they want to buy the computer, so they want the valuation to be higher. And nobody says that valuation has to be book value or tax value or even fair market value. So they're going to push to get that value up so that they can either expense it you know, through other tax vehicles, 179, or depreciate it over a three to seven year life so that they can pretty much get the benefit out of that equipment or that piece of that asset quicker. For the seller, especially on a fixed asset side, they're going to be subject to depreciation recapture and then capital gains. So for, for a tax bracket, let's say close to the 40%, which is our maximum at this time, the capital gains rate, when you consider net investment income tax as well, is just shy of 24%, where the ordinary tax bracket is 40%. So in selling anything that's going to carry ordinary gains, such as depreciation recapture, you're looking at a 40% tax rate on that as opposed to any item that's going to have capital gains rates being roughly 24%, assuming that this particular practice owner is in, is in the highest tax bracket as they probably are. So when you get to those items, so you see them on the screen, so the fixed assets, and that kind of you know, breaks down how they're going to be depreciated by the buyer and what the impact would be on the seller. So the seller wants goodwill, which is essentially the difference between Whatever that purchase price is and whatever that asset allocation is, the difference between those two numbers is goodwill. And it's negotiated. Yes, that, that, this whole thing is negotiated at this point. You know what that purchase price is, but the negotiation happens on how this asset allocation trickles down to make sure that that goodwill number is beneficial to both parties. At least that's the goal. Um, and some of these deals, I'm sure, George, you've seen, f probably fall apart at times at this rate if you don't know both parties. So I guess in, in our experience, a good practice is when you have a buyer and seller, that at least you know enough about each other to understand this portion and how it impacts you both so that you get what you want out of the deal at the end of the day. You do want to sell the practice. 
you do want to buy the practice. And so how do you make that work for both of you? And so with the competing interest, you really want to be knowledgeable about your global tax structure, not just your business, but your personal um, financial picture in total, as well as, as the seller needs to know that as well. So there are huge impacts to tax when you do make a sale. Another facet that is negotiated but is not part of this presentation is that compensation. Now there's always going to be a transitional phase in an exit. You don't just sell the practice and walk away the next day. The buyer needs some transition and hand-holding to make sure what they're buying conveys. And what they're buying is really the future cash flow. And that means the patient base. So the object is to streamline that transfer of ownership. What is the compensation going to be during the, trans the transition period? Now, in some cases, the doctor is going to stay on for an extended period as an employee. And that the higher the compensation, the lower the free cash flow post-closing to the buyer, the less value the practice. So that's going to be a little bit of a seesaw. And something that is rarely addressed sufficiently in the negotiations is governance. Who's going to be responsible for making what decisions? We don't want the corporate practice of medicine impinging on health care. So we don't want the investors making decisions after the closing that are going to hurt the patient base. So these are things that if it's clearly defined in the purchase and sale agreement, you can eliminate a lot of those blow-up deals that crater after the closing once all the money has changed hands and it's too late to go back and undo it. Another approach, aside from the capitalization or discounted future earnings, and those two are really the same thing. The only nuance there is future earnings discounted back to net present value assume a number of years when we don't have a stable projected earnings figure in the future, whereas the single period capitalization, you should arrive at the same value. You're just assuming that the earnings are going to be a lot more stable. It's not going to be up and down across the periods. If you got a consistent earnings base in the past, that's probably a pretty good assumption until the government changes how we're compensated. The market approach is going back to historic sales and databases of actual transactions. What we'll do is take those businesses that transacted, and this one particular graphic with the redacted information in it comes out of a database called BizComps, and the metrics that are being measured here are two, the gross revenue multiplier. That's one earnings figure. The other one is the discretionary earnings. Now, in this case, it includes the doctor's compensation. So where we talked about capitalization of earnings after fair market salaries on the income approach, on the market approach, because doctor's salaries are discretionary again, we're going to normalize to be able to compare apples to apples by adding that back in to the EBITDA. And what we wind up with is a regression line across the graph here where we have the revenue on the x-axis, we have the sold price on the y-axis. Now as we look at that regression line, we see the data points are far away from that regression line. And what that indicates is Way over on the right side at the top, there's a tiny little formula over there, and at the bottom it says R squared. And in this case, the R squared is 38.38. What that means is the gross revenue multiplier for practice sales in this particular sample is only 38% effective at it predicting what that practice should sell for. Now, every single transaction as a buyer and a seller. Each individual instance is unique to what their reasons for buying and selling are. And that's why there's going to be such a variation in any transactional database. When we go back and we look at another metric from the same data set, we wind up with the multiple of owner benefits. In this case, we have an R squared of 0.53. That's a much higher R squared. That means that we're 53% more likely to wind up with an accurate estimate for what that practice should sell for, and the data points are much closer to that regression line. So that's just a little bit of statistical analysis, but again, every transaction is unique to those buyers and sellers, and we're just looking for the trends and trying to use that as a proxy for what to expect in this instance. Now, not everyone can buy a medical practice. You have to be a medical practitioner to practice. 
And in some states, you're not allowed to own an interest in a medical practice unless you are a licensed physician. Now we've got private equity groups are coming into the marketplace. And private equity, we've all heard about, Wall Street investors, but these aren't publicly traded companies. They're companies that can do what's effectively insider trading deals. They can take advantage of their special knowledge for what they're going to do in the future and capture that increase in equity, gain that arbitrage, because they're privately listed. They're privately owned. They're not publicly listed, so there's no requirement that they disclose everything to the public and let the public get a chance to co-invest with them. Now, when we see private equity groups investing in physicians' practices, historically they didn't do that. They used to go after specialty practices because the reimbursement rates were so much higher, there was a lot more money to be found in the specialty practices. With the changes in healthcare and with big data coming into what's happening out there in the marketplace, they're betting that they're going to be the smartest guys in the room and able to capitalize on that big data. The one thing that is to the market's detriment with private equity is these companies usually have a pool of funds from other investors, and they promise uh, usually about a five-year payback. So they're in this for the short haul. They're not in this for the long haul. They want to make the buck and exit and gain some arbitrage and buy low on the multiple and be able to sell high once they've got a much bigger earnings figure. And that average is about five years again. Now, some other considerations with healthcare. There's something called star clause, and that's where a physician is not allowed to self-refer. You also have anti-kickback laws, where patient brokering is illegal. So when a not-for-profit healthcare group acquires a medical practice, they're precluded by law from paying more than fair market value because they're not for profit. So no matter what the individual needs are of that particular seller, they're going to rely on valuation experts to dictate what they're allowed to pay for that practice. So that's something that if you're pulling the right levers far enough ahead of time to make sure that your practice is transparent, the valuator is going to have a much lower perceived risk and a much higher value for that same practice. And who doesn't want an extra multiple of EBITDA? Now we're going to open it up for questions. You took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> yes, if anyone has any questions, please wait till we have the microphone in front of you so that way we can make sure that we get everything on the video as well. Any questions? Okay, I will start over here with Jerry. Jerry Cassia, Merrill Insurance. Um, whenever you go in and do an evaluation and you have the buyer and the seller you're both working with, what's the average time it takes to come up with the statistics enough to go to the negotiation board to finalize it? Depending on how well packaged the opportunity is when it goes to market, a lot of that information is going to be in what's referred to as the offering memorandum or the confidential business review. And that articulates the individual processes and KPIs and trends and makes it a lot easier for that appraiser to establish what he thinks that risk factor should be. So the better packaged the business is, the shorter the turnaround time. The best case scenario, it's typically about two weeks. Sometimes they go into the months. And it's a matter of gathering the information necessary to ascribe a value to what is that black box we call a practice. Yeah, my question is on stripping that equity out beforehand. Um, what are some of the other methods of doing that as opposed to just the defined benefit plan? I mean, are there other average um, practices that are used for that? What's the best practices? It, if you're looking to do it in a tax reduction manner, um, probably not a whole lot of other ways that you really can strip it out. Um, you know, you can do a wage dividend carve out if it's an S corporation, but you're still going to pay tax on even the dividends that you pull out and you're going to pay tax at that ordinary rate. Um, so really the best reduction for tax purposes is going to be the defined benefit program. And I think it's important also when you're, 
when you're looking at tax deductions, um, sometimes the, the, the higher compensation that you're taking in order to do a qualified retirement plan and get that equity as you go gives them the, the, the income as well so they can then create other avenues of tax deferred growth because if, if there's a good planner in place, they'll give them some, some ways to put some monies into vehicles that is tax deferred. And another big, another big goal for practices is to, is to be in uh, their investment portfolios and their planning is all about asset protection and, and reducing the risks because there's, uh, there's a lot of litigation out there and people are that are that there are big targets. So all of the all of the tools that we look at, we also keep that in mind while we're looking at minimizing risks to the practice. I think if you can take away really one big takeaway here is often when you're selling a practice or, or a business, you're you're invested emotionally. And that I think is the biggest reason why you would want to surround yourself with the proper team from the beginning. So you know, you may want this number because, you know, like we had talked about, you birthed that business from the beginning, and it may not be realistic. I'm actually going through that with a client myself right now. He was in business one year, and he went to market with, you know, great financials, at least transparent-wise, but, you know, he wants this number because he, you know, I, I put all my blood, sweat, and tears into this, and it's really only worth this number. So I think the biggest takeaway is, you know, this is not something you're going to do tomorrow, ho hopefully. Um, but if you're even in a remote possibility that you think you're two to five years or seven years out, you need to start thinking about that now. And it's not really that early to start talking with someone like George where he can start to evaluate it now and put in processes that can increase that valuation later. You know, um, banker, attorney, evaluator, accountant, your financial planner, your retirement planner, these are all people that you should be surrounding yourself with already in your business to be successful, but then also to make that exit. Very well put. I'm actually going to ask a question. Um, being with Roar Internet Marketing, we do a lot of website development and marketing for medical practices. And we have found that, uh, and some of the argumentation we use when they're evaluating what kind of website to go with is to think about what is going to be a valuable business asset to the practice. because when we build something, we do not retain any ownership of it. We give that ownership of everything we build and do to the practice. And so that becomes a valuable business asset. And we've had a medical practice, you know, spend $20,000 on a website and years later they have reaped the benefits of all the new businesses or new patients that they've received and then their digital assets are now worth $120,000 on that spreadsheet of assets which is a great example. And so I always point that out to go, hey, you know, yeah, there's a lot of companies out there where you basically pay them a monthly fee that's real cheap, but you don't own anything. You stop paying, it's gone. Do you, I guess, what, what have you run across in terms of, you know, the website and the digital assets? Are, are doctors thinking about that as assets? Mm -hmm. Do you guys point that out? Just, I just wanted to kind of see if, if I'm the only Lone Ranger out there talking about it. From my perspective, it's often overlooked, and it's not a category that is typically looked at by the evaluator, but it, that's changing. And another upside benefit to that is that $20,000 investment to the $120,000 value is capital gains treated. For the seller, but it's amortized over 15 years to the buyer. So that, again, is that shift between buyer and seller in negotiating. So what could be valued at 120 may end up being a different number at the closing table in order to make that shift mesh. Okay. Yeah, and I think also on your, on your website, when, you, when you're developing it, there, the mindset now is that you can track the revenue that comes in. Oh, absolutely. And so now there is a meaningful number there where they didn't know what was coming from which, which place. So I think it's going to become even more valuable and it probably will end up in evaluation area that will be uh, just like goodwill it'll be a very valuable uh, yeah. line item definitely thank you yeah. thank you oh. Connie had one John had one too but okay. <laughs> hi Connie Rollberg PNC Bank and hopefully we do have clients that start with the end in mind and so let's say that they work with you they understand how to position the practice for a better sale the goal is always to buy low, sell high. 
so Janelle, I guess this would work, we talk about the dream team, mm -hmm. but as the CPA, do you ever find a point in a practice's life where the physician is getting older, he still wants to work, but the production is starting to decline and it might be time to consider whether he wants to sell the practice or she wants to sell the practice now and continue working in a different capacity. How do you broach those conversations? Can you walk us through the, the ending, um, the last 10 to 15 years of practice life? I think in general for any practice owner or a business owner, um, you know, ideally you'd like your business to run independent of you. And I think in a practitioner's case, that's pretty much not possible unless it's something in a group setting. But, you know, if you're a sole practitioner, um, probably going to be really difficult to do that. And so I, I struggle with this quite often with all my clients, really, is, is trying to be brutally honest and without tearing off the Band-Aid, so to speak. But in that particular case, and I'm, you know, George may have worked with other people in that capacity, I just think that if you, if you know you're going to be stepping away and that's going to directly impact your financials, your revenue, your, your patient experience, you need to start figuring out possibly is it time to sell and then stay working in that as a W-2 employee or under a management contract, um, something that would be attractive to a buyer so that they can still reap it when it's, the revenues are high as opposed to if you're going to just let it fall off. On that note also, Jerry and I have an instance where it's a disability issue. And it's not the seller's decision to sell. So having everything in place and posturing yourself for the what-if scenarios is critical. Yeah, and I have a lot of conversations with um, practices and, and it's, not a, it's not a sell high. It's a sell it for as low as you possibly can. That'll then meet your goals because I don't, I'm a big fan of not paying that extra money out in taxes. And again, it goes back to the time. So that when you say, what's the last 10 or 15 years of the conversation, I'd love to have 10 or 15 years with a lot of them, but you don't. In reality, it's probably five or less. And um, in five years, though, I can strip out and, and get a million out if, I could, if, if that was necessary. That'd be better than none. And that still saves a ton of income taxes. Yeah, uh, not necessarily in medical, but the uh, question is, how often do you see or what kind of percentage do you see of people selling the businesses to employees or someone in the business versus an outside entity? The inside transaction is probably much higher in medical practice than general business sales. I do not have a statistic on that. Very low. There's not, there's not many because of the way it's... Uh, the, the younger employee or the younger physician, I, I agree with George, it's happened more in medical practices because you can position the, the younger physician's already seen a block of the patients and there's a continuation and the transition is very easy. Uh, when you're selling it to a management team or a, an, a sole owner who generally has control issues, that means they want to really maintain control until they die, and um, it's hard to turn that over. So what happens is, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a slow process to give the younger employee some ownership and then for the owner to stay on for a three, usually a three-year uh, payout. Hey there, Dan O'Connell, uh, more of Ambassador. And um, I like the simple way you seem to present this and I recommend everybody go back when this is edited and posted to review it again because there's a lot of pearls here. And for somebody like myself, I may be confused but at a higher level. <laughs> and to kind of even the plane, what happens is your term of rear window accounting, Janelle, I can identify with not many people, it's not transparent, it's, it's a fog to them. They have those simplistic thoughts that they saw that. So my question is, how do you begin with the end in mind and do these things all along the way? What, what should a doctor or a practice be looking at all year long or how available should that information be for them? A no-brainer to me is a clear set of financial statements um, and not just looking at how much cash is in the bank, which is something I hear quite often and just kind of cringe at. Um, for most physicians and business owners alike, they want a certain lifestyle and I, in my mind, because I've been there, done that, you know, and that's, you know, kind of how I know a little bit about stuff like this, but if I can go out and go eat lavishly and, and buy whatever I like and my spouse is happy and I'm happy, well, that's my lifestyle. 
but what is that really on paper? And I am not surprised, but often disheartened by the amount of practitioners who really haven't even taken a look at their financial statements um, and, and understand what that actually means for two reasons. First of all, their overall financial picture and making sure that the team that they're surrounding themselves with is, is able to guide them to the proper end. The other is embezzlement. With 80% of practitioners experiencing some sort of embezzlement, financial statement and transparency is key, um, not only in their operations, but then also in the transition period as well. Yeah, I would echo that the, the, the process that they should be watching is, is understanding who's doing what with respect to how their, their security is set up, how their cash flow is coming in, taking a regular salary. Otherwise, then, then you're not going to be successful on the qualified plan side either. But if you set up those processes, and, and I, I would say that most of the time it's because we've gone in there and, and as a team educated them on all the aspects. Say, this is what you're currently doing. This we've found, but with our experience, has been a better way to do it that's helped make your life and, and the balance and what you want to try to achieve a lot better. So we recommend that you do this. Now, we can't twist the arm and force it, but it does work. And, and so if they can adopt those principles, and it can't, it can't be you know, um, everything at once. It, be, it is that process where you have to say, let's, let's tackle this. If it's the financials, let's tackle this. If it's something else on your lifestyle or your debt, or don't make decisions out there on your own without you know, talking about it and how it affects the team. Uh, and I just team. echo that best practices. If you're doing the things, the right things, you're going to have that transparency. You're going to understand what's happening inside the practice. Yeah. We have time for one more quick question. Thank you. Uh, Kyle Platt, best consent. Um, access to patients and billable services to the available demographics is a huge component of evaluation. evaluation. And I'm just curious, um, as access to healthcare is changing dramatically with technology, uh, especially with telehealth, mm -hmm. um, how are you guys accommodating that with your valuation and projections? To understand what's happening in the practice, why certain aspects of revenue are increasing and decreasing. There's a normalization of revenue that goes on in deciding what is the sustainable earnings going forward. And that's anticipating what is pay for service, pay for fees, or fee for service, what is managed care, what is the different revenue streams have different valuations associated with them. So once you normalize what is the going forward revenue, then we normalize the expenses. And it's a very technical uh, answer to a very simplistic question. There's a lot of statistical analysis that goes on and third party databases to ascribe certain RVUs, certain aspects of what's coming in as revenue going forward. Well, thank you very much. I know you all have a few more questions, but perhaps we can continue the conversation on our LinkedIn uh, group. Let's give a round of applause to our panel. Thank you.